young people are idealistic. They want to believe in some kind of ideal. And I think the left is is very good. They've got this suit, this bizarre notion of, of of what socialism can do if we get it just right this time. And the right has some idealism in religion. So I think it's less attractive to young people. But, you know, yeah. uh, maybe when Jordan Peterson tells them to make their bed, that's attractive somehow. <laughs> yeah. But we need, we, need a, we, need an, I, I, we need to be idealistic. We yeah. need to portray a beautiful picture yeah. of the future. What we do a lot and we're very good at is complaining. We complain about the world today. We complain about the present. We complain about the government. We complain about the culture. But we are not very good at projecting our ideal and projecting what is possible and giving people the tools to live the best life that they can live. So today we are discussing how to make classical liberalism mainstream again. It's obvious that modern politics is dominated by leftist and conservative movements, but there is little um, place for the classical liberal ideas or what I would call maybe the true liberal ideas, right? I think one of the reasons, one of the obvious reasons is that in general, most people don't really know what classical liberalism is and why it could be a viable alternative in modern politics for the mainstream, for the dominant ideologies. Uh, so could you please explain very shortly uh, what is the essence of a classical liberal ideas, how it differs from modern uh, dominant ideologies and how to revive its place in the society, the society's awareness of it. So I think classical liberalism, uh, almost purposefully, is not a very, very uh, clearly defined term. Uh, but it, it is an emphasis in political discussion on liberty, on individual liberty, on individual freedom. It is the idea, broadly speaking, that the government should be limited, should be limited primarily to protecting our lives and our property, it should be primarily focused, I think, in the best interpretation of classical liberalism. It should be a, a, a focused on the protection of individual rights, properly, properly defined and properly understood. And that generally the government should leave individuals free to pursue their own lives, free to start their own businesses, uh, contract with other people. It should protect property rights, it should protect contract rights. It should provide for the national defense and police force and the judiciary. But beyond that, uh, classical liberals tend to be skeptical about anything else uh, that the government does. Some of us would like there to be a complete ban on the government doing anything else. But uh, classical liberals generally have wanted small and limited government. I think part of the part of the reason the classical liberalism is less known today is that many of these liberal parties of a long time ago, in a sense, sold their soul to the devil. Mm. They compromised and compromised and compromised and compromised to the point where they merged into a left or merged into the conservative movement. Uh, they didn't stick to their principles. They didn't uphold this idea of limited, uh, limited government. Uh, uh, some, you know, the, the, it, at some point there was a crisis and some people needed help, so the government helped them. And then the crisis, maybe there was another group that needed help. And then the, 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 the help got institutionalized and we got a welfare state. And the liberals didn't really fight against the welfare state. Uh, and, then, and then maybe there was some business crisis and the state said, oh, we better regulate that because businessmen are behaving badly. And the liberals didn't adamantly object. And then that expanded slowly. And, and slowly the liberals kind of lost the passion about fighting over this. So I think for the public, they just really haven't experienced classical liberal ideas in a, any kind of organized, systematic way. They're not familiar with them because much of the of the older liberal ideology kind of faded away as the liberals, uh, as the liberal uh, agenda was compromised. Um, and indeed, in the United States, it got so bad that ultimately the left stole the term liberal. Yeah. Um, and today, when you say liberal in America, everybody thinks you're talking about the left. Um, and uh, so if they object to the left, they object to liberalism. And then what are they left with? 
kind of a conservative right. Exactly. Uh, so, so there's a lot of confusion about the term. There's a lot of confusion about its history. And ultimately, there's a lot of confusion about what it really stands for. And, and this is where I think the biggest problem lies with classical liberalism. What is it? What, what do we actually believe in? Yeah, I think we will get back to sure. the problem of the dichotomy. Sure. But do you have any ideas about how to solve this problem, yeah. you know? Well, I think, I think there are two things that have to be done. And, and any solution I give you is not going to be a short-term solution. And any solution I give you is not a silver bullet that everything changes instantaneously. I think the first is we need to be clear about what classical liberal is, is and what it stands for. And I think we need to bolster its defenses. We need to bolster its philosophical foundations. Uh, for example, classical liberalism is, a, a, traditionally has always been, a, a, a dominant, a, a primarily a, f a political philosophy. But political philosophy rests on other branches of philosophy. It rests on certain foundations, moral foundations, epistemological foundations. I think to really dominate, we need a, a consistent moral and epistemological philosophy. We need a set of ideas that are not just economic and not just political. A set of ideas that don't just involve, yeah, we get a higher GDP. And, and yes, I value freedom, but I know other people don't value freedom. How do I get them to value freedom? Well, getting people to value freedom has more to do with morality and more to do with philosophy for their own life and what kind of life they want to live than it has to do with economics and politics. So I think we need to engage in much more with a cultural debate about what people should live for, how to live, uh, what, are, what lives are worthwhile living, um, and, uh, and, and, and become advocates of human reason, for example, because I, I, I don't think, I, I give you a quick, quick example, right? Plato, the philosopher, believed that most people lived in this cave, right? He has this cave analogy, and we see shadows on the wall, and we don't know reality, and we can't know reality, and we can't know truth, and in a sense, we can't take care of ourselves. Only the philosopher can exit the cave that we're in and see the actual reality, the sunshine, the world, the forms, as he advised it. So only the philosopher knows the truth. Now, if that's true, if that's epistemologically true, me and you can't see reality, only the philosopher over there can see it, then freedom is useless to us yeah. because we can't, we, we can't discover truth. We can't discover how to live. We have to just listen to him. Every authoritarian regime in history yeah. is basically based on this platonic idea. We have to be willing to challenge that, not just politically, not just emotionally, but also philosophically and say, no, we believe in reason. We believe every individual has the capacity to reason. Therefore, every individual has the capacity to discover truth, discover his own values, knows what to do with his life. And therefore, what we need is freedom so that individuals can pursue their happiness. Not so that we can maximize GDP, as many people do, right? Many classical liberals tend to do. But so that individuals can actually live the fullest, most complete life that they can, and they have the capability to do that because we're all beings of reason. Man is uh, the rational animal. Let me elaborate a little bit on the issue of truth and maybe put it a little bit differently, right? So I think part of the problem with statism and with intrusive ideologies in general is maybe even the obsession with the idea of truth, which is not necessarily the same as truth, you know? But I think for classical liberals, part of the idea is that, you know, many issues, on many issues, truth is subjective, right? Or on many issues, we don't even have truth, right? So I know you represent uh, an ideology which is called objectivism, yes. so it, it may sound kind of, you know, um, uh, mutually exclusive, but on the other hand, I think if you really value truth uh, or value like the most important principles in life, so to say, uh, you have to be a little bit minimalistic, right, about these principles. So uh, this is where we disagree and where I find myself okay. disagreeing okay. often with classical with, liberals. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think there's a real difference between dogma and truth. Yeah. I think there's a huge difference between being dogmatic and, and being a truth seeker. But I consider myself a truth seeker, and I think good people seek the truth. Um, I seek the truth in my own life. I want to know, for example, what is really good for me? Now, I know that sometimes I'm going to make mistakes. Truth is not, reason is not uh, infallible. We're going to make mistakes. But I'm, all, I'm looking for what's right and what's just and what's true. 
I want to know that in the physical world. I I, I want to know. Yeah. You know, I disagree with Hume. This okay. is a mug, okay. and that is water, and I am drinking it. There's, it's not a probability shit thing. This is certainty. Yeah. This is truth. And I think that, that that Hume, for example, and others, other classical liberals who have become skeptics and become skeptics partially as a defense mechanism against the truth of communism or the truth of authoritarianism. Yeah. I think that's a mistake, and I think it, it opens the door up to kind of the subjectivist left. So my values are my level of my, my truth with regard to my values are mine. In that sense, they're subjective, right? The, the, you know, what, what, how much I value water versus Coke, only I know. You, you can't tell me what's right with yeah. regard to that. But whether this is a mug or not, that's an absolute truth that both of us should be able to agree on. Um, truth is really, really important. And having a mechanism to discover truth is really, really important. And understanding the process of discovering truth is really, really important. And that freedom, part of the reason we want to be free okay. is so that we can go out and discover what's true but, and but what's we, good. But we can't force people to have that, the That's why it's not dogma, right? right? So you can't. Yeah. So this is the opposition to a Catholic church that, that burns people at the stake or that puts Galileo under house arrest because he's searching for the truth. People can be wrong about stuff. I can disagree with them. They might be right. I might be wrong. Absolutely, politically, we are free to, uh, and we can't impose truth on other people. But we certainly can advise people. Uh, I certainly want my doctor to be able to tell me, I, I, I think this is the treatment. I think this is the right treatment. I think this is true <laughs> in that sense. I might get a second opinion, uh, but I hope uh, that, that medical science comes up with truths because I want to live long and, and I want them to be able to, to cure diseases and that requires science and truth. So I, I'm a huge believer in science and truth, what I don't believe is imposing any of that on other people. People have to discuss. Indeed, it's not truth if it's imposed on you. That's one of the things that philosophically is important. If you accept something because somebody told it to you, it's it's not true for you. It's just it's just something you accepted. It's just it's it's subjective. It's completely arbitrary. Uh, I want people to have to 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 embrace the mechanism of truth discovery, which is human reason. And I think. Classical liberalism needs to embrace this. It needs to embrace the fact that, classical, you know, that free markets is that they work is true, um, and it's it's not questionable. It's not you can't be a skeptic about this. That we all the facts line up. They all line up uh, for the cause of freedom. Uh, so I think epistemology is really important. Having a theory of knowledge is really yeah. important. And having a theory of knowledge that leads to actual discoveries about the world is crucial for liberty. To continue with the issue of why modern classical liberalism mm -hmm. is weak, so obviously it's mostly associated with libertarianism nowadays, and would you agree that libertarianism tends to attract, for whatever reasons, uh, many people who are dogmatic or radical, and who in turn radicalize or make this ideology more dogmatic, appear, make it appear more dogmatic to most of the people. So what are the reasons behind that and, and what's the possible solution? So I think there are a couple of things here. I mean, I actually like the word radical, so I, so I embrace the word yeah. radical. I think dogmatic is a bad word, but radical means consistent and radical means... But, so I, I, okay. I like that word, but um, I, I, I do think it's dogmatic. I do think a lot of people attra attracted to it. I think a lot of people uh, who uh, embrace these ideas don't fully understand them. Yes. Don't internalize them into their own life. At the end of the day, I always ask people, why do you want to be free? And if you hesitate and you're not sure how to answer that, there's a problem. You haven't internalized the value of freedom. And it can't be, I just want to do whatever the hell I want. It has to be a real value to you. Why do you want to be free? I, I know why I want to be free. Because I want the opportunity to live the best life possible to me. I want to uh, pursue happiness. And the more freedom is, the more opportunities there are for me to pursue happiness for me. And I want to live the most flourishing, successful life I can. Freedom is one of the prerequisites for that. Um, so so I, I think a lot of people have not internalized it, have not made it personal, don't understand it. And they, the theory uh, is in a sense a floating abstraction. And they've studied the theory, it looks true to them, it all connects, uh, uh, you know, kind of logically, uh, 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 but they haven't really seen it in reality, brought it into their own lives and understand how it's connected to life and, 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 and humans, human existence and human survival. 
Uh, and young people, it's almost inevitable that young people would be dogmatic, right? Because you just don't have the life experience. I was. Okay. No question. When I read Ayn Rand for the first time, I was on a crusade. Okay. I was going to convince everybody in kind of a, you know, hit their head with a hammer kind of way. And then as you... As you go older, you 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 learn a how to convince people, how to how to debate people, but also you learn that my goal in life is not to convince them. My goal in life is first to to to, to understand and to to live a good life and, and to study the ideas, and and convincing others is is something you, you you do later. And you certainly don't achieve anything by throwing a hammer at their head, right? At at being being obnoxious and being nasty. I think the other problem that exists in libertarianism. Is I think at some point, and I think I think this the point is really Murray Rothbard more than anybody else. At some point, libertarianism takes a off ramp off of the liberal highway, if you will, and and it goes off in a direction of what I consider uh, an ideology that that's anti ethical to uh, classical liberal and 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 I think to to, to reason, and that is uh, the idea of anarchy. I, I think anarchy is a disaster. I think anarchy is 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 counter to liberalism in in classical sense. It's counter to freedom. Anarchy devolves and must devolve logically and existentially in reality into gang warfare and violence. It always has. It always will. There's a reason why in the culture anarchy is a negative term. It's chaos. Chaos is not a good thing. Uh, and I think I think one of the things that classical liberals like the Founding Fathers of America understood, and I think that Ayn Rand understood, is that government is not a necessary evil. Government is a necessary good. Government creates the conditions for human flourishing if it's the right kind of government. And if it's we, limited. And it's, it's limited by the principle of individual rights. Uh, if it's limited by that principle, it's a necessary good. Civilization can exist without... Some entity, you don't like the word government, call it something else, I don't care. But some entity that has the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force only uses force in retaliation, I mean, to protect, never to uh, violate people's rights. And that is what creates the conditions for markets to evolve. It creates the conditions for people to experiment with art, to experiment with their personal lives, maybe, sex, marriage, who knows. But it, it, it provides the conditions and, and that make all that possible without violence, without force, without coercion from other people. Uh, anarchy uh, rejects all that and I think creates a condition where human flourishing is impossible. And I think that too many young uh, libertarians are attracted to this, I can do anything I want to do, kind yeah. of an emotionalist attitude. And they get the logical abstract sequence that Rothbard or somebody else lays out and they never connect it to, to actual reality. And in actual reality, it doesn't work. So you would probably mostly agree with Robert Nozick on his defense of the minimal state. I, I mostly do. I would do it a little differently. Different. But, and okay. Ayn Rand does it a little differently. But it, but in spirit, absolutely, uh, I, I agree with So him. maybe another issue is that maybe libertarians are failing really to communicate their empathy to most of people. Like It seems like a very anti-empathic, so to say, ideology because, maybe partly because libertarians refuse to um, engage with many important issues such as environment in many cases. Like some of them do engage, mm -hmm. but many don't. And um, many people have this uh, kind of perception that they just don't care, you know, and they are just bad people who only think about themselves, etc., etc. So what would be your response to that? Well, I, I, I think that a proper political movement has to have answers to all the questions that concern people, whether it's, uh, whether it's questions like environmentalism or the environment, or whether it's questions like what to do about the poor, which always comes up uh, when you're discussing these things. You have to have an answer. The answer might not be the most pleasing answer always, but you have to have an answer and you have to have a program. Environmentalism is a good example. I think libertarianism has a lot of interesting things to say, can have or free market ideologies, uh, classical liberalism, can have a lot of interesting things to say, while not negating the fundamental principles of, uh, of property rights, while not negating the fundamental principles of a limited government that's limited to the protection of individual rights. One then, what one needs to do is frame the environmental debate in the context of individual rights, in the context of uh, you know uh, uh, something happening in an environment that actually does me harm, 
well, then if something exactly. if something's harming me, then the government has a role to play. And then we have to figure out exactly what will, under what conditions, and it can be complex. It, it might not be straightforward. Now, obviously, the, the, the simple way, to, the simplest way to deal with it, most environmental issues, but not all of them, is, is private property. The more private property we have, the fewer environmental issues we have. And, and the reason for that is simple. We know we've got a thousand years of common law history that says you can't drop your garbage in my backyard. Well, if everything is somebody's backyard, yeah. Even things like lakes and rivers and, and, and oceans and stuff. And we can find ways to privatize these things. And we have, you know, in the history, we have done things like this. Then we can we, we can explain to people how, uh, you know, having water rights solves a lot of the water cleanliness issues and, and the same. But there are issues that go beyond that. Air, for example, is very difficult to conceptualize in terms of property rights. Uh, I'm breathing something that you're polluting. What do we do about that? Uh, and now uh, harm is an issue. If, if I'm harmed by something you're doing, we know that if you blast your stereo really, really loud in the middle of the night, I can sue you. I, I, even in a laissez-faire capitalist world, I can sue you. You don't have a right to intrude on my, on my sleep uh, like that. Well, you don't have a right to s- throw your cyanide or whatever the yeah. air. And, and so you go to courts. You you know you 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 have some conclusion about the damage that this does to people. The government has a role to look at that and see. Hmm, it looks like these particular chemicals are really damaging to human life. They have a, they have the ability. They have I think the obligation then to either reduce their use or to ban them or to do something uh, in in that limited way in the name of protecting your rights. But I just want to give one counter example because this is it's a dangerous okay. field. Imagine in the middle of the 19th century, um, you're in London, the Industrial Revolution is happening, everybody's burning coal, everybody. People are burning coal in their homes, people are burning coal in the factories, the air is full of black stuff. You're going to get, some of you are going to get sick, some of us are going to get sick. Um, Do we stop the Industrial Revolution? Do we ban coal at that point? Or do we realize that maybe people are getting sick, but overall something important is happening here and and we need to let it play out for a while at least and then maybe clean it up but we need to play it out uh china faces the same faced i think the same uh challenge if development requires some pollution for a while but the value of development the value of becoming rich the value of bringing a billion people out of poverty is huge well maybe we can tolerate some pollution for a while and then clean it up so these are the kind of issues that need to be thought through, and and I think governments need to uh, need to be involved in thinking them through. But there's real danger of stopping progress before it happens uh, if you do if you overdo it, if you exceed the limits. Sure. So basically, we agree that there is a place for regulating pollution or other environmental factors because of the need to protect individual liberty yes. and because of yes. the need uh, to protect property rights. So, um, yeah, of course. But uh, concerning your example, I think uh, you've really um, touched on another crucial issue here because many libertarians really have this kind of approach where they just don't want to weigh pro and con factors. They just want to have this simplistic answer where they say, you know, if it's noise, why why are you talking about noise? Are you a socialist or something like that? You know, I've heard this kind of arguments. Or, you know, um, somebody can just go in the street and shoot all around him unless he hits you, you know, but, but it's obvious from the scientific or truth perspective that, that if there's somebody running around um, with a gun, and just shooting, <laughs> you know, there is a chance that the, he Absolutely. will hit you. Absolutely. And, and I, uh, my freedom to some extent includes the freedom to be uh, protected from that risk, right? Absolutely. So, if, if, I mean, take a simple example. Uh, certainly a gun would, would qualify. But let's say somebody is driving on the private streets, but they're yeah. driving in a way that is clearly endangering people. Yeah. Right, maybe they're driving fast, but not just fast. They're swerving and they're cutting off people, and, and they're going to kill somebody. There is absolutely the role of, of of our police force of 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 a law to say, 
irresponsible driving, harmful driving. And you have to make it objective and you have to be careful again, not to give the state too much power. But yes, risk is a factor. Let's say you're next to a construction site and I believe there should be no regulations of construction. You know, let the market work. But you notice that the crane is tilted and it looks like it's going to fall on your house. Can you call the police? Well, of course you can. There's a real risk here. And then yeah. police send an inspector in and say, you know what? You guys, you're crane. You've got it wrong. You need to, you need to fix it. So the, the risk, real risk, again, and, and you have to be careful and we have to be objective and we have to be truthful. Real risk is a concern. It is something, uh, a real threat is a concern. And it's something that, that uh, a threat to life and a threat to property. Just like today, if I threaten you, right? I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do something. The police can stop me. And I think that's completely legitimate. Uh, it, it goes beyond speech at that point. Now it's a, it's a, it's, it turns into a, a physical threat. Uh, when a physical threat is faced, whether it's through uh, uh, pollution or whether it's through a, a crane that's tilted or whether it's through somebody uh, driving drunk, absolutely, I think the state has a role to play. And, and we should think very carefully on how to... Um, make those laws and make them limited and make them limited to individual rights again and how to protect. But absolutely, uh, I think this idea of anything goes uh, is is very dangerous. And we know what happens when anything goes. When you get the chaos of anything goes, people demand order. And the order then is provided by a strong man. The order, you know, anarchy will always devolve into authoritarianism. So since we've already criticized anarchy and we've... Uh you know, stated that uh, some libertarians have an um, excessively restrictive view of the role of the government. Maybe it's at this point not obvious to some of the listeners then what's, uh, what is the essence of our problem with the statists, you know, like with, with the left or with the conservatives. Uh, because at one, uh, on one hand, uh, obviously there is place for involvement in the environment and, and you know, uh, things like that. But on the other, there are still lots of areas where there is no need for state involvement whatsoever and uh, where modern states are increasingly yeah. involved. So I don't think of it as there's, there's a place for the government to be involved in my environment. I think of it as, as there's, a, there's always a place for the state to be involved when life is threatened, when yeah, human life yeah, is threatened. Exactly. When That's what a, I when mean. there's a real threat. Yeah. Uh, for example, I don't think there's any role of government in welfare. So what to do about the poor? Nothing. The government has nothing to do with that. Um, but if I'm running at you with a knife, yes, the state is there to protect me. And if I'm throwing cyanide in your face, yes, the state is supposed to protect me. So when life is threatened, when property is threatened or when life is attacked or property is attacked, that's when a state gets intervenes. Whether that attack is through the air, yeah, that's environment, yeah. or whether it's it's in other way. And of course, what what defines the modern left and the modern right is there are no limits exactly. on the state power. The modern left is obsessed with um, with redistributing wealth and, and, and using what I produce to help other people. Um, and, and taking my wealth and redistributing it to others and, of course, and controlling what businessmen do and how they do it and what they do in central planning and the idea that they can plan everything. But even when it comes to the environment, they believe that the environment is an end in itself. Uh, it's not only an issue of threats towards us, but we have to protect snails and we have to protect this and we have to protect that because they have a value in and of themselves. They have an intrinsic value that does not relate to human beings. Uh, uh, the government should only be involved where humans are involved. The government should only be involved in protecting human life. Nothing more than that. Uh, and uh, it, it, there is no intrinsic value in nature. Uh, value is something that comes from human beings. We value nature. You value nature, you love forests, buy some. Right? I think if there are even more obvious examples like modern states like Georgia or any European state for that matter are heavily involved in education, yes. in culture, in yes. sports, you know, like why? Because I mean, there nobody's going to die if we don't have a volleyball team. Well, you know? well more than that, I, I, yeah. I think by, by, by having a volleyball team, you're denying somebody the capital to have what he wants exactly. to have. Exactly. And, and, and yes, education, I mean, the horrors of public education are well known. But more than that, there's this, they are now, one of the reasons people don't know about classical liberalism, maybe, is because the state is running our educational system and they have no interest in knowing about it. 
Uh, so yes, the, the government is involved in everything. I think I think one of the worst things is the environment because I think it's all encompassing. They use it to regulate everything else. Yeah. But I agree, education, healthcare. Europeans love their socialized healthcare, where the state is telling you what medicines to take, where the state is telling you what treatments to get. Um, and and, and, all, and and this is where the right comes in, right? The right is a little bit more sympathetic in economics. Okay, you can do your thing in economics a little bit. But they want to regulate culture. They want Georgia to be Georgian. Right. Uh, and, and they want to regulate immigration. And they want to make the movement of goods and services and people and, and capital. They, they, they want to regulate. They, you know, they want the national sports team or whatever. Yeah. So, so the conservatives have given a, in a lot to the left on economics. It's interesting how the debate between the left and right has changed over the last few years. It used to be mainly about economics. Now it's mainly about culture. Uh, and the, the battlegrounds have shifted. Basically, the right conservatives have given up on economics. They've given into the left. The state can do anything in economics now. Uh, and and now the fight is about, I don't know, LGBTQ, right? That's yeah. where the fight is. It's not about regulations or anything like that. But yes, uh, Ayn Rand said once, the left, because it's Marxist, is materialist. Uh, therefore, they care about the material world. Therefore, they want to control and regulate the economy. They don't believe in the spiritual world. So they don't care what you do in your bedroom. They don't care how you behave generally. They leave you alone in the spiritual world. The Which right is not even not true anymore. Nowadays. But it was yeah. it was okay. in the old left, right? right? And then the old right didn't care about the material world because there's an afterlife, right? So the material world doesn't matter. So you, yeah, you can do your capitalism if you want. It's kind of grubby and we don't really like it. But you can do your trade and your free markets. But the spiritual world that's important. What you do in bed. That's really important. So that we want to regulate. What's interesting about the modern left and right is now they both care about everything and they want to regulate everything and they want to control everything and they don't want to leave us even a little bit of freedom. That's why we talk about an opportunity for the classical liberalism. Now is the time. Uh, I think the left and the right have proven themselves to be completely bankrupt. People are starting to get it that there's something really, really wrong in the culture something really, really, really wrong in the economy. The economy is approaching bankruptcy in the West. The culture is approaching bankruptcy in the West. Now is the time to offer an alternative. And I think I think the the the, the alternatives, you know, and the way to do that is there are no shortcuts here. The way to do that is educate. Educate, educate, educate. Teach people about this alternative. Teach people about freedom. Teach people about the value of freedom to their own life. Teach people about the value to the culture and to the economy of freedom. And we need to we need to talk, 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 educate, 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 and get the word out. They write books, write articles, do podcasts, do videos, do whatever we can to get a clear, consistent. And this is where, again, I'm for truth, right? A consistent message of the value of liberty without denying real issues and real problems and real challenges and, and how and, and presenting we need to present real solutions to it. But I think uh, there we are facing another huge challenge beyond education because you know the way democracy is structured unless it's very restrained by constitution mm -hmm. is that you know politicians can spend money essentially um, and If you can spend money, you can sell ideas about w the ways of spending that money. So one problem is that we don't have any limitation on where the state can get involved, you know. But the other problem is that the state has no limit on the amount of resources it controls, right? Sure. So, so it's an uphill battle. It's very difficult for us. Uh, I, I would say that this is a reason why... I think the most powerful tool we have today, beyond the ideas that we have, is is the web, is the internet. I mean, uh, it, it doesn't cost us much to get onto the internet. It doesn't cost us much to produce videos. I mean, there are people producing videos and making a lot of money off of just iPhones and stuff. It doesn't it doesn't require the kind of capital and resources to educate people like it did in the past. In the past, you had to study university, you had to study. Now you can do everything online. So I think, I mean, I find it disappointing that that uh, people who advocate for free markets have not better utilized and better capitalized on the existence of the internet and our ability to communicate ideas to large numbers of people at a marginal cost of close to zero. And, uh, and, and we've left even these channels 
to, uh, I'd say the right is pretty good at it. So, you know, the Jordan Petersons, the yeah. Ben Shapiro's of the world. And then, and of course, the left is also good at it. And, and where is... Where is our Jordan Peterson? Where is our capturing the imagination of people? Where is our using this new medium to communicate effectively with the world and, and, and inspire? That's the other thing we need. And, and this is something I think that's really important. Young people are idealistic. They want to believe in some kind of ideal. And I think the left is, is very good. They've got this, suit, this bizarre notion of, of, of what socialism can do if we get it just right this time. And the right has some idealism in religion. So I think it's less attractive to young people. But, you know, yeah. uh, maybe when Jordan Peterson tells them to make their bed, that's attractive somehow. <laughs> yeah. But we need, we, need a, we, yeah. need an, I, I, we need to be idealistic. We yeah. need to portray a beautiful picture yeah. of the future. What we do a lot and we're very good at is complaining. We complain about the world today. We complain about the present. We complain about the government. We complain about the culture. But we are not very good at projecting our ideal and projecting what is possible and giving people the tools to live the best life that they can do. Again, I think this is one of Ayn Rand's strengths because she wrote novels. She told stories, stories which projected, I think, uh, a, a particular philosophical ideal that I think young people respond to. It's why she's, she's so popular among young people. Uh, but we need to do a much better effort on every front, from economics all the way to morality, and projecting uh, an, 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 an ideal and exciting people and getting them excited and passionate about the future that this free market, classical liberal ideology can lead to. I think you've touched on a very important point, which is how to attract young people. And I would even specify that we really need to attract creative people, you know? Yes. Uh, and uh, you've mentioned Jordan Peterson. Even Jordan Peterson is uh, a part of this problem with the left-right dichotomy. Because mm -hmm. you've probably heard uh, the way he describes liberals versus conservatives. His vision is that, you know, like liberalism, liberals are inherently these um, creative types yeah. and conservatives are order-oriented types. This is liberals in the American sense. Yeah, exactly. Leftists, That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Because when Jordan Peterson uh, talks about liberals versus conservatives, he really talks about leftists yeah. versus conservatism. Yeah. And he doesn't see a place for true liberals there. Yeah, but he's also wrong. I mean, yeah. he's also wrong because the reality is, if you look at who is a, 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 a strong leftist in, in the United States, it's not just the creative types. It's lawyers and it's, it's successful people. I mean, that's the sad thing, it's smart people. Smart and successful people attracted to liberalism for all kinds of reasons, liberalism in the American sense, yeah. the leftism. leftism. Yeah. Uh, partially because they've rejected religion and, and, and because they, they're taught that there's this dichotomy. If you're religious, you're, you yeah. know, it, that's conservative, so you don't want to be that. So yeah. all they've got is kind of this. Exactly. And partially because the right rejects science and rejects I think, seeking truth in this world, they tend to go left. Uh, you know, so I think, yes, we definitely need creative types. But you know what? I also think we need Nobel Prizes in physics. Imagine a, a, a Nobel Prize in physics, uh, you know, in the Nobel Prize speech talking about the liberty to think yeah. and, to, and to, to, to use his reason on problems that may be the conventional wisdom. That, and, uh, you know, all, this is what I mean by... A, I think what a, a broader vision of what liberty and freedom mean and how they apply to individual life and how they can inspire individual people because the kind of thinking that leads us to say entrepreneurs should be allowed to start any company they want without asking permission also says to the scientist, you can explore any venture you want without asking for permission and without the government dictating, we're now on, this is a hot thing, so uh, yeah. we'll give only money to that. Um, so it's, it's, we need people in, in all fields. I think the most important ones are, are creative fields. Art, I think, is aesthetics is crucial. The reason, I don't think we would have had an enlightenment without a renaissance, right? Yeah. So, so you have to have the, the art maybe even before you have the, the, the more ideological part of it. So we need, we need sculptors and painters and musicians and, and, and novelists and, and video makers and movie makers. Um, and then I, I think we need educators. Yeah. We need a lot of educators. We need people who can teach and, and, and uh, educate people, whether they do it online or whether they create their own schools or whether they create alternatives. Uh, we, we need scientists. We need to link our vision 
to science uh, because I, because I think science is an incredibly powerful tool and a good tool. Again, I think part of the part of the damage libertarians are doing in the post COVID era, if you will, is blaming scientists for what yeah. happened. And 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 maybe some scientists need to be blamed. They made mistakes, sure. right? And 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 some of them are, some of them are just wrong. But to blame science to wrap it all up, and we don't want you know scientists. Shouldn't, well, scientists have an important role to play, and they tell us something about the physical world that we didn't know, that we don't know. Not all of us can know these things. Not everybody's the epidemiologist, even yeah. though everybody is an amateur epidemiologist these days, among among conservatives and libertarians in particular. We, we need experts. We need scientists. Let's not throw out, throw that out. So we need a, a whole. Uh, we need young people. We need idealists. We need passionate people. We need people that understand how important freedom is to their own lives and understand that what they really want is to is to make their lives the best lives that they can live. Exactly. So I think if uh, we were more successful at, at disassociating um, classical liberalism f from conservatism and from anarchy, we would attract more. Uh, creative types, because this is the ideology of freedom, right? I agree and, with you completely, completely. And even with your example about London in the 19th century, I think there is the answer to the issue why we need scientists, you know? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. to weigh the pros and cons, to weigh the risks, yeah. You have somebody to calculate that, right? roughly speaking, right? And we're, we're living in it right now. I mean, somebody yeah. has to calculate the risk of climate change. Yeah. Somebody has to calculate the risk of not using fossil fuels. <laughs> yeah. And 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 somebody has to give us at least a vision about what is possible in terms of alternatives. Yeah. The common man, most of us can't do it. I don't know what those all. I mean, I read up about it. I I, I have I'm educated somewhat about it, but those somebody has to provide do the lab work that is necessary to provide data so that we know what we're doing. So uh, absolutely, I, I think we, we need, I, I think the classical liberals need to separate themselves from, from the right. Uh, I think they're being associated with the right, with very negative elements within the right, um, you know, and particularly today with the rise of, of nationalism and the rise of, of authoritarian rights and the rise of a, uh, of a kind of, of, a, of a kind of paleo right. and. Uh, it's very dangerous, I think, for those of us who believe in freedom to be associated with them. And of course, I think it's easier to disassociate with the left. Uh, but we should make sure that we're not lumped in together with, uh, because maybe we use the word liberal sometimes, uh, lumped together with uh, with the left. We, we with, need to define our own space. Yeah. We are the advocates of liberty and freedom and individual rights and limited government. Sure. So to wrap it up, let's talk a little bit about the history, how we got here, right? So obviously, founding fathers of the US, they had their own flaws. They were different people. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I would guess that they simply didn't envision all the potential risks which would come with technological progress, which would come with democracy, because you know, like there was not much evidence about democracy back in 1776, right? Well, they so, wrote about democracy. So Madison writes about democracy and he warns us about democracy. Yeah. And he says, democracy, we are not creating a democracy in America. Democracy is a bad thing. Democracy is always devolve into majoritarian rule where the majority oppresses the minority. It's why ultimately we have a Bill of Rights in the American Constitution. So they were very aware of the risk of democracy. Uh, but you're right. They they didn't know all the risks. I mean, industrial revolution hadn't started yet. Yeah. The the kind of progress hadn't existed. They didn't understand all the risks. We have now 250 years of experience. We know what the flaws are with the Constitution. We could do a much better job, I think. But I'd say there's the the deeper flaws uh, with the founders, and they were philosophical and intellectual. And again, I'm not blaming them because again, they they were writing in the 1770s. Uh, they only knew what they knew. But the reality is that, that America was founded on, on, a, on a certain ideology of, of quicksand, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they weren't quite willing to give up the, the, if I doubt, a foundation that is laid in, uh, in religion. Um, so they were men of enlightenment that said religion should be in your home. But they didn't really have an alternative methodology for for uh, uh, for living, for values, for morality, 
for discovering truth. So they are they're conflicted men, and that I think ultimately is in uh, is in the um, is in the founding. This is why I think to some extent they feel responsible for the common good, and therefore Thomas Jefferson gets involved in public education very very quickly because it's for the common good. Mm-hmm. Whereas I, I think we understand that there is no such thing as the common good. There's the good of individuals that you can aggregate in some sense, but there's no. We're not targeting the common good. We're targeting the good for individuals, and we, we and the good for individual as a, as a, as as the best within an individual is to be free, and we leave people free. And it, some people would abuse that. Some people will ruin their lives because they're free. But also, maybe um, to give a particular Fine. example, like the U.S. was founded on literally on the opposition to the excessive taxation, right? So. Yes. Uh, but then probably, allowed- probably it was hard for them to envision that we would have um, states like uh, controlling fifty percent of of the GDP. Yeah, but they, you know, but from the beginning they had they had tariffs. From the beginning they 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 struggled with how to balance this idea that they knew taxes were somehow bad, coercion, and force, and with the needs of the state, and they they struggled with that. Taxes were very low in the beginning, uh, but. You know, maybe they couldn't predict it 50%, but maybe 10%. It crept up quite dramatically. Uh, of course, they were founded on the on the great contradiction of slavery, and that should have been a, a real indication that something was going to give, something was was a problem here. But, you know, they gave the, the government the right to coin money. They gave the government the, the ability to do things that I don't think government needs to do or should do that open up a Pandora's box in terms of violation of rights. Maybe not now, but as we move forward. Uh, you know, from the beginning, banking, for example, is regulated in America. So, so as good as they were, and they were about as good as any political group of people ever were, uh, they didn't know, they couldn't predict. Uh, we now have a lot more data. We have a lot more knowledge. Uh, we also have, I think, better ideas. I, I, again, I will mention Ayn Rand because I think she's a key figure in, in some ways in completing the philosophical mission of the Enlightenment, in, in solidifying our defense of reason and solidif- solidifying our defense of this idea of pursuit of happiness, of individualism. And we have a lot more capabilities today to A, create a better constitution, but also just to educate people about life in a way that would pose less of a threat to whatever government we institute. Let's remember that no matter how strong the constitution is, if people don't want it, it won't survive. So, uh, you know, when Franklin, I think it was Franklin, walked out, or maybe Madison, walked out of the Constitutional Hall, somebody asked him, what government did you give us? And he said, a, 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 um, a republic if you can keep it. Yeah. Right? And it's if you can keep it. And then there's a phrase about uh, eternal vigilance for, for, for the cause of liberty. We, the people, always have to be vigilant. We, the people, always have to be. But to do that, we have to be educated about it. We have to commit to it. We have to believe in it. We have to want it. We have to want freedom. And that's where I think we need to educate people on the value of freedom to their lives, to why it's good for them to be free. Now, you know, we, we like to talk about abstractions and demand supply and how does it affect my life? Well, here's a whole menu of how it affects your life in every aspect. Thank you very much. I think what you just said summarizes our issue, our topic pretty well. So thank you for um, finding time for this podcast. Thanks for having me. Bye.